So a couple of years ago, I believe it was at the uh, beginning of 2020, we started the Come As You Will Be in 2023, just depicting on what we wanted our life to look like three years down the road. So we set what was a really ambitious goal for us at the time. I believe we had 100 properties. We were like, we want to have 350. So we want to increase our business you know, three and a half times. But during this exercise, my brother was like, why do we only look out three years? Why not look out 30 years or 50 years? Or what do we really want our great, great, great grandkids to be? Uh, how do we want them to be benefited by this? And some of that stuff is outside of our control, but why not have fun and plan for it? <laughs> hey everybody, welcome back to the View from the Top podcast. My name is Kevin Wally Wallenbeck. And I've got a run, Big A Walker. How you doing today, Big A? Hey, Wally, you're getting better on my name there after seven years. Uh, hopefully, you'll get it right one of these days. You're getting close, but my mom Amen. says Aaron. You say Aaron, but we're not going to debate too much of that today. Man, listen, I want to tell you how excited I am about today's podcast. Uh, real estate's been a huge part of my life. Probably 50% of my income has been derived from real estate. From the very beginning, that's at 44 years now, I've been dealing in real estate. And when I was putting together a few of my thoughts, I started reminiscing. I started thinking back about real estate. And someone asked me not long ago, Big A, when did you buy your first property? And initially, I said 18 because Robin and I were getting married. And then I thought, I said, no, that's not. I bought a piece of property, Wally, when I was 16. Wow. And uh, 16. people say, how is that illegal? <laughs> it is in Nashville. No, okay, it's not. Right. It's like, so I got in the car. I, I was 16. I'd been driving probably six months. And I learned about this place about 100 miles from Nashville called Fairfield Glade. And it was this big resort they were building. And it was a big deal. You know, this is a long time ago. This is in the 70s, Kevin. And Ooh. so I drove up there and I had to call and meet a realtor at the gate. And he got there and he said, uh, you're a young man. I said, yes, sir. I said, I'm here to buy one of these lots. So he put me in a Jeep, drove me around. There's nothing but dirt roads. I mean, literally, no, not even gravel. These were dirt roads with, in a Jeep. And he stopped and he said, you see right over there, there's going to be an 18-hole golf course. And right across the street is going to be a clubhouse. And there's going to be beautiful homes built. And he painted this picture. He sounded like Rembrandt the way he was describing this. And I was like, I don't really see it. You know, it's like, all I see is dirt roads. And I'm scared if you get off in that ditch, we may not get back to my car. He said, I promise you, young man, here's the plat. You pick out one of these lots. I think it's going to be time well spent. So I went back, we looked, and I picked out a lot. And it was on a place that was supposed to be called Dorchester. There was a golf course they were building there. So he said, uh, we got to set up the closing. You'll put $500 down. This lot's $3,500. And I thought, dang, that's a lot of money for back in the woods on a dirt road, but I'm going to do it. So I did, closed out on the lot. And then uh, a couple of weeks later, I was reading in the paper and it said, uh, Fairfield Glade in trouble may take bankruptcy. And I'm like, Ooh. oh my gosh, my first real estate investment ever. And they may take bankruptcy. And so I called back up there, got the same realtor, met him back up there. And I said, hey, I want my money back. And he started laughing at me. He said, uh, we don't give money back on real estate purchases. And I said, yeah, I checked with somebody. And when you're 16, you can't even buy real estate. He said, are you 16? And I said, yes, sir. So make a long story short, they tore up the forms. They wrote it off. They sent my $500 back. Well, Kevin, here's the part I'm embarrassed to admit. They didn't go bankrupt. Today, there's a golf course there called Dorchester. And the lot now that I would have owned if I'd kept it is selling for over $400,000. It was like what? primo, premier, right on the golf course. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. So when we started thinking about different guests that we want to bring in, man, Will Ingram was like at the top of the list. These guys have done remarkable things with real estate. In about 60 months, these guys have amassed 400 properties and he's going to tell you exactly how you can do the same in the city that you live in so kevin what do you think man it was remarkable wasn't he all the details that he shared and how that he and his brother ryan have accomplished this yeah it's pretty cool i've known these guys for for i don't know four or five years maybe now i think they had started uh or about started when i first got to know them a little bit and to watch their their growth and your trajectory Mm. that that's exciting 
but you'll hear him talk a little bit about today. And this is the, this is the part for me that I really get a lot of, I get a kick out of, I get a smile is that their preparation and the way that they live their lives to be able to get to where they're at. Mm-hmm. Right. Let, he'll, he'll talk a little bit about that today, how they got prepared and through those transitions, right. Of starting a business over the last five years. Uh, and uh, they didn't mention it, but Ryan uh, came from law enforcement and Will came out of the military. He mentions that today and out of sales environment. So it's, like, really, it's a great example of what's possible, man. What's you know possible what's cool is they ditched security for the opportunity. And I mm-hmm. can't wait for you to hear the interview, man. Let's get started. Let's bring him in. Let's do it. All right. Let's get, uh, let's get Will. Hey, Will. Welcome to View from the Top Podcast, buddy. How you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on, Big A. Well, you know, when we had dinner together in Dayton not too terribly long ago, you and your brother, uh, we had a great roundtable discussion. And I knew after I left there that you were going to be one of the first guests uh, because your story is absolutely amazing. So thank you for coming on the show today and sharing some of your wisdom and some of your experience. And if it's okay with you, man, I want to dive right in. Is that good for you if we just dive head first? Yeah, that works for me. Let's do it. Well, I know your story and your background, but uh, give give the listeners a little back uh, backstory about uh, you, you had a great job before you got into this new venture that you're doing. And tell us a little bit about that and uh, the armed forces. First of all, thank you for your service uh, for all these years in the armed services. But uh, t- tell us about this job that you had previously to the one you've got now. Yeah, of course. So I was in the Navy for about seven years. And then I got my undergrad in mechanical engineering, which I did not use during my time in the Navy. And um, I knew when I was transitioning from the armed services out into the private sector, I wanted a job that would reward me based on performance. So I went into a sales job where I could earn commission. And um, there's always downsides or unknowns that play into that. Uh, Part of which is, you know, earning a reduced paycheck for a little while until you build up that pipeline. So my wife and I really prepped quite a bit and uh, saved up for that kind of to mitigate the risk if I did have to go a little while without a paycheck. Um, So I sold heating and air equipment for a couple of years in Jacksonville, Florida. And then my brother and I, the whole time we're growing our rental portfolio. We started in 2017 and then Mm -hmm. uh, all single family homes here in the Dayton area. And then uh, two years later, we had about 60 rental properties. And that's when I was juggling the heating and air job because uh, it was a full-time job. I mean, we're talking 40 to 50 hours a week to get all the stuff done. And then the rental property business was just in my off hours is uh, when I could work on it. So I needed something. Gonna, with, uh, go ahead. Mm-hmm. I was just going to say, let's, let's go back even further, though. So I, I want to go back. I want to understand why you got out of the Navy. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, first and foremost, I got out because I'm a family man and I spent way too much time out to sea. I was on ships for four years and I was out to sea for three of them doing training in the Atlantic Ocean and out in the Middle East. So I spent three years you know, out on the water. <laughs> and uh, you, you hear folks say all the time, though, that you do your 20 and by that time, you'd still be a really young man. Like, did you ever consider that? Did you ever think about doing your 20 and then retiring from the Navy? I knew a couple months into being on ships that is not something that I wanted to do for 20 years. Not something I wanted to make a career out of. Were you married when you first went in? I was not. But I was dating married. my girlfriend, who's now my wife. So we dated long distance for about two years before we got married. Yeah, that's pretty hard to do, isn't it? Yeah, it sure was. But even if yeah, she lived in Jacksonville, I, I still wouldn't have been there. <laughs> yeah, you're out. So then, then you come out and you get this HVAC salesman job and you're doing that. What, was it rewarding? I mean, what, was it uh, something you enjoyed doing? I've always liked construction projects. So we worked mostly on new construction jobs. So you'd read a set of plans, uh, look at what the plans called for as far as heating and air equipment, and then... Uh, put your best shot out there, line up your equipment and uh, go hope to win the job. So it, it's tough, though, because, I mean, at any given job, you got probably like a 15 to 25 percent chance of winning. Mm. So sometimes a little bit higher, but that's that's about what I was at. 
But in a sales job, you're going to make pretty good money, be safe to say that you did okay and there was opportunity to grow. So what was burning deep inside of you to make this transition? That's what I'm looking for. Like, was it dissatisfaction? Were you looking for a change of scenery? Were you looking for more wealth? Like, what was the motivating factor that caused you to be disenchanted with the HVAC sales job? Yeah, of course. So I had to take uh, one more intermediary step between um, selling heating and air and then doing the rental properties full time. So I really liked sales, um, but what I disliked was the length of time, length of our sales cycle. So heating and air is typically six to nine months to a year from the time you look at plans and sell a job to the time when you actually get paid for it. And that's a long time. So I wanted something with a shorter sales cycle. So that's why I went into mortgages for a couple of years. And I also, uh, my brother and I were, we had 60 some properties at the time and getting long-term financing was always an issue for us. So I wanted to get on the inside and figure out how to do long-term financing. Figured if I could speak the same language as the guys, the lenders that we're trying to go to, it would really help out. Yeah. There's uh, how did you make that transition? Like, what was the catalyst that caused you to one day go, okay, I'm I'm done with the nine to five. I'm getting out of this. Uh, a lot of listeners out there right now are, are right where you were at then. And I want you to take us back to that conversation with your wife and you're sitting on the couch and you're talking through what the future looks like. You've got this sense of security. Uh, things are going well. You're getting a steady paycheck. And uh, you're with this, you know, doing these mortgages, you're doing the HVAC and every Friday, you know, you're getting this check. Uh, What was the conversation between the two of you then to take this entrepreneurial leap? Yeah, of course. So um, it it was tough at first because, I mean, I had when I was selling heat and air, I got a a draw every other week or uh, first and 15th, something like that. So even if I didn't sell anything, I would just go down on my draw. Most commission guys know what I'm talking about. But then uh, switching to mortgages, it was 100% commission, no draw. So you get paid on what you sell, and that is it. <laughs> the, um, but we had saved up a decent amount of money for it. We probably had uh, maybe eight months worth of living expenses, maybe a year mm-hmm. saved up. Um to kind of go through that period. And we knew that there was decent money to be made doing mortgages. And it was a great time too. It was an interest rates were pretty low. So there was tons of folks refinancing. Um, I'm a veteran and there was plenty of veterans in Jacksonville to help out. So just finding a community to get involved in really helped out. And then um, fast forward two years and my brother and I, we started paying ourselves finally from our company. We'd been building this company for four years and had never really taken a paycheck. So we started ramping up the amount that we were paying ourselves and then started feeling uh, more and more comfortable as my entrepreneur income was uh, going up. You know, I could sure. wean off the mortgages, essentially. And mortgages, it's a, it's a go at your own pace thing. So since I was 100% commission, I had no production requirements. Um, so I could, if, if I wanted to spend 100% of my time doing entrepreneur stuff, then I could. I just didn't get a paycheck for selling mortgages. Kind of a nervous period, wasn't it? Right. You got kids, you've got a wife, you've got expenses that you've got to do. So you had to balance that. I like it that you just didn't cut the umbilical cord all at once. You're like, no, like I'm going to transition into this, right? That's safety for your family. And I like how you did that. So you and Ryan get together after this and you go, okay, man, we're going to go all in. Uh, take us to that point. What was that conversation like? How did y'all decide to do this model? And then share a little bit about the model and how you're doing these house acquisitions. Yeah, of course. So um, it was at the be- end of 19. I believe we had somewhere around 100 houses. And we set our 2020 goal to buy 100 homes, essentially double our business. And uh, we actually did it. So, and we did that the whole time while I was selling mortgages too. So when we finally got up to about 200 houses, the income became more and more regular. And then it just made more and more sense to go ahead and leave the, uh, the mortgage business. So I, I still did mortgages. Like I cut off 
building my pipeline and only took in referrals, which I knew as a, a, a sales guy, I could take in a referral and close the deal and doing all the paperwork took me maybe four hours and I'd make two grand doing it. So that's the only clients I took on towards the end, uh, just to keep bringing in a little bit more income while I was making the uh, final switch over to doing just our business. Listeners that are out there right now may be thinking, well, hey, Will came from a family with money. He had the resources. He had the ability. Uh, and I know for a fact that's not the case, right? Yeah. They're hearing you talking about buying 60 houses, 100 houses, and here we are now just under 400 houses that you guys have. And so how did you how did you do that? Where did you get the money? How did you buy these houses? Yeah, of course. So Ryan and I started with our own money first, which we ran out of after about three or four houses. So I think we both- Don't had- take long when you're buying houses <laughs> no. to run out of money. No, houses are a very capital intensive business. Uh, so we got three or four with our own money. And then we looked to our family and our, our family, we didn't come from a family with a lot of money. I mean, my, both my parents worked for the government. My mom was a teacher and my dad worked for the state. He was a, um, worked in one of the juvenile facilities as an athletic director. Um, so neither of them had uh, you know, high paying jobs or anything. But I was always been interested in real estate and you know, always wanted to take that leap. So we ended up doing it and, you know, I, I couldn't be happier. It was, times were definitely tough in the beginning, but um, we, we made it through. Was your family trying to talk you out of doing this or maybe some of your peers or colleagues? Yeah. So I, I think for a, a small period, my wife was trying to talk me out of it because she was like, well, why do you spend so much time doing this real estate when you're making decent money doing mortgages? But the whole time, my brother and I were building up our portfolio. And once I started paying myself from the business, it made a whole lot more sense to my wife. So she became on board after that. Yeah, Robin's that way. If I'm not bringing home any money, she doesn't understand this business model, right? <laughs> yeah. It's like, hey, give me a check. I need to put some money in the bank. Uh-huh. So what did you tell your mom and dad or family members that were around you? Like, how did you, like a lot of our listeners out there today are being discouraged by their families to chase their dreams. And I want to know what you would tell those people and how you responded to your family. Yeah, of course. So my mom has always been supportive of my brother and I, uh, regardless of what we were trying to do. So she's always been our, our biggest fan. She really liked what we were doing. She liked seeing pictures of these houses that we would fix up here in the Dayton area. And from a financing standpoint, I mean, my my parents would lend us what money they did have. So that that was really kind to them as well. But then uh, going back to your other question about the financing piece, I mean, we started expanding our network and that's how we really found uh, a decent chunk of private investor money, which we got about 10 million of private investor money under management right now that we use to go out and buy these houses and then we'll refinance them down the road and essentially recycle those, that $10 million. We do that twice a year. We can buy $20 million of houses a year. So that's a, that's a decent number of houses. So you, you go to the bank after you take this hard money and you pay these investors and then you go to the bank and you take what, five, 10, 20 houses. Like t- tell us how that works. Yeah. So I'm doing a package right now. I've got uh, 10 houses lined up that I'm refinancing in the next two weeks. And then I'm doing another package of about 66 houses that I'm going to refinance over the next couple of months. Uh, I think this lender is going to make me break them up. And and all these different lenders have their own funny requirements. So I've got to uh, bring, I think, $1.5 million loan amount to the table is what the lender wants. So that for us, uh, maybe around 18 to 20 houses that I'll have to wrap together into one loan and provide them all the document and paperwork that they want to uh, go ahead and put us on long-term financing. So you're you're in Dayton is where you're doing this. Um, Thank you for riding me around and showing me all the houses. We go down all these streets and you're like, we got three over there and two over here. And we own the whole left side of the street. We went down one street. I think you owned all the houses on the street. And I was like, man, they need to make y'all mayor of Dayton. Like y'all are, radically changing what's going on there. Can, can people do this in other cities? Is it specific in nature to just being in Dayton or is there other 
areas that this could that you could do this also? I think so. I mean, I think it can be replicated in other areas. The key thing that my brother and I do is we buy discounted properties. So that means there's something wrong with the properties as to why they won't sell on the market at full retail value. And we do buy some straight off the MLS, but not near as many as we get from wholesalers or from um, probate or sheriff sales or any of those methods. And the ones we get off the MLS most of the time is because the realtor mispriced them. And realtors are people too, and sometimes they make mistakes. And then uh, when we feel that a house is undervalued, then we'll go ahead and buy it. So to answer your question about people in other markets, yes, it is possible to find discounted properties. If you're in a really competitive market, I was in Jacksonville, Florida, which is, uh, I think, number one or two in the country as far as the number of -of out-of-state investors flocking to that area. That was an extremely difficult environment. There are still people doing it, but it's much more difficult than in an area like Dayton where there's not the big outside hedge funds or whatnot that are coming in, swooping up all these properties. I bet you guys are pretty popular with the realtors there. Uh, They know you guys are active buyers. Do do you need somebody on staff to be making these acquisitions? Can you just work with a realtor in your local area? What would be the first right step for someone listening today to emulate kind of what you guys have done there? Yeah, so right now we use one realtor to buy all of our stuff on the market and to make offers for even some stuff that's off market. The only time we don't use him is when we've got a wholesale deal lined up. So that's when a wholesale agent has the house under contract uh, from the owner. And then they just assign their contract to us and mark it up a little bit. So they make their you know, three to five grand or whatever it is they make. Um, But yeah, we use a realtor right now and he does great. It's nice working with one person because you get to build that relationship. And we're doing so much business right now that our one realtor is outperforming whole teams in his office. So we thought about taking a realtor in-house, but our guy is not necessarily up for it. And I don't know if financially it'd make a whole lot of sense right now, but I mean, some people do it. So interest rates are creeping up. Yeah. And I don't need to tell you that, right? You know that. So how does that creeping, impact? Wait, 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 wait. Creeping up? <laughs> spiking. Creeping up? Oh. Okay. okay, they're spiking. Yeah. <laughs> they're spiking up. Thank you, Kevin. Words matter to Kevin. And so I've got to pay attention to the, to the words I used. Okay, so we've got this bottle rocket that has launched called interest rate, right? <laughs> and so how's that impacting uh, your growth? Yeah, of course. So uh, when I left the mortgage business, I think I could give somebody a rate in the threes. And this was around December of last year. But now your primary homeowner is at seven and a half, like seven and a quarter to seven and a half right now. Investment properties are typically 1% above that. Um, mm. So we are like, we just got to the point where refinancing becomes more difficult. Um, for whatever reason, I just talked to my lender Last week or two weeks ago, our rate was 8.3% is what we're going to do the refinance at for this million dollars, the 11 houses. Uh, but it just, they dropped it to 6.8. So I'm not entirely sure why. I still need to figure that out. <laughs> but That's those prayers, <laughs> yeah. you and Ryan. That's what it is. It's answers to prayers. That's why. Yeah. So, Man, what a gift. So yeah, sometimes how, how, many more, how many more packages can you send his way? <laughs> yeah, right. quickly. I need to send all of them. <laughs> I'm trying to get three of them lined up right now. So, uh, yeah, no. yeah, I bet you are. Uh, yeah, because two percent of a million dollars—I mean, that's twenty grand a year. And what, eighteen hundred sure. bucks yes. a month, somewhere in there? Yeah, that's a big deal. Yeah, that's almost that's an, a big deal. You can almost get an employee or a decent portion of an employee's pay for that. You know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, uh, what does it look like going forward? Like, I know there's kind of a component that you guys—it's not just about making the money. Uh, share a little bit more about the strategy behind what y'all are trying to accomplish. Yeah, of course. So when we first started this, our goal was to fund our kids' college education. Um, My brother's got five kids right now. I've got three. Uh, The oldest is eight. So we've got about 10 more years uh, before we'd have to fund their colleges. But then once we really got rolling, we realized what more of an impact the business could have than just that. Um, I mean, for example, we're reviving streets within the community. 
and we're having a big impact on any of our tenants lives because they've got a safe place to live now uh, whereas before I mean the house might have been dilapidated or vacant or abandoned for the past 10 years uh, right now we're employing 23 different sets of general contractors so and that usually looks like a two-man team a, a lead guy and a helper in a truck so that, that's a lot of families that we're feeding right there and we got uh, four employees for the management company we bought a cabinet and flooring shop recently because we go through so much of that material and it's got five employees and uh, i mean that's a lot of families that we're feeding now so it's a big responsibility and uh, but it's also a big benefit to the community and that that's really what we love doing well in total transparency when i first started learning a few years ago what you were doing and I heard just bits and pieces of the story. I was like, man, they're buying these houses nobody would buy. And uh, so I decided to take a couple of days and come up and visit with you and Ryan and really enjoyed our time together. Need to come back up there. That restaurant y'all took me to was off the chart. So we need to go back there, by the way, But as a side note. But when you rode me around, I was pleasantly surprised. And to go into the houses and then see before and after photographs, and what y'all have done with these houses is nothing short of amazing. And so, man, thank you uh, for having this community mindedness. Sure, you're making a profit. You're providing. Uh, I was trying to do the math as you were calling that out, but somewhere, you know, nearing 75 to 80 families that you guys have impacted in the past less than 60 months. Yeah. I can only imagine what's going to take place as a result of, uh, your aspirational goals going forward. So when I talked to Ryan last time, Ryan's a deep thinker as well as you. He was talking about hundreds of years, like legacy stuff, like what kind of conversations are going on at the Ingram household. You're not just talking about 36 months, we're going to do this. This is like generational plans that you're doing kind of unpack a little bit of that for us. Yeah, of course. And a, a lot of this started with the Iron Sharpens Iron Mastermind. So a couple of years ago, I believe it was at the uh, beginning of 2020, we started the Come As You Will Be in 2023, just depicting on what we wanted our life to look like three years down the road. So we set what was a really ambitious goal for us at the time. I believe we had 100 properties. We were like, we want to have 350. So we want to increase our business you know, three and a half times. And uh, that, that was a massive goal for us at the time. And fortunately, we reached the mass of properties 13 or 14 months early. Um, so now we've got time to make that profitable. But during this exercise, my brother was like, why do we only look out three years? Why not look out 30 years or 50 years? Or what do we really want our great, great, great grandkids to be? Uh, how do we want them to be benefited by this? And some of that stuff is outside of our control, but why not have fun and plan for it? <laughs> why not see if well, we can do uh, it? Let's break that down. Let's break that down a little bit. So let's go back for a second. 2020, uh, you were introduced to a program, Come As You Will Be, in 2023, setting these aspirational goals. Do you think, no one knows, but do you think you would have achieved or accomplished that goal 13, 14 months early if you hadn't been as laser focused? No. Do you think it would have happened anyway there's, or not? There's no way. Uh so Ryan and I, we would have set the quarterly goals or yearly goals, but there's no way we would have thought out three years or five years or, you know, a hundred years down the road. Okay. Okay. So, and now that's morphed into this legacy piece and you want your children involved. I love the picture uh, Ryan's got hanging in the room behind you. I think it's to your left on the wall of his son uh, being involved in one of the properties, buying his first house. And I forgot I don't want to mess it up. He's only like five or six years old, I think, in that picture. And y'all yeah. get your kids involved. Tell us what that looks like. Yeah, of course. So uh, Ryan totes around his kids to the properties. Ryan's really the one that scopes out the properties and walks through them. And occasionally him and his son will uh, go do a light rehab on one, too. His son's five years old, proficient with a drill. He can paint. He can even patch drywall. I mean, I'm not the greatest of drywall patchers, you know. You can always see the tape when I'm done with it. <laughs> uh, but he's five years old and he's doing drywall repair. Yeah, that's good. He's got a three year old daughter that does some work too. And um, I've done some landscaping with William before, nothing serious. William's my oldest son. Um, 
And then I've gotten them on the computer a little bit. I do all the spreadsheets. So I'll put all our properties in a big spreadsheet and then uh, work on refinancing them. So he's eight years old and he likes math. So he, he enjoys getting behind go. the computer doing go. that kind of thing. <laughs> Y'all raising them up and uh, teaching them. That's really good. So everything is not awesome. Like everything is not like, oh yeah, we're buying all these houses and making all these millions of dollars. Take us to a time where you made a bad choice. Oh yeah. Something that you bought or, or has there been, has there been a time that you bought something that uh, didn't pan out exactly right? Yeah. So um, one of the biggest mistakes we made early on is uh, we bought four properties all at one time. We paid almost nothing for them. I think we got them for 1500 bucks a piece. This was back in uh, 17 or 18 when properties were still really cheap. You could buy these abandoned homes for almost nothing. We got a quote from a contractor to fix them all up for 80 grand. And he wanted like a quarter up front plus every draw every week. So we agreed to that. And we ultimately paid the guy way more money than progress he had made. So he said he'd finish all four houses inside of like a four month timeline. And he finished like three quarters of one house in four months. And we had paid him half of what we were supposed to pay him in total. So uh, we lost a decent amount of money on that. And then another mistake we made is we bought a house that had been condemned and we uh, for lead poisoning. And we didn't know it had been condemned because of lead poisoning. We missed some of the paperwork at closing. And I mean, it's just, I shouldn't say that it's something that happens when you buy, you know, eight houses a week or however many we've been buying. Make mistakes. But yeah, yeah, we make mistakes. So sure. um, that cost us about an extra 40 or 50 grand. I happened to go in that house and it looks amazing. And after you told me what you were all in for, I was still like willing to give your money back. I'm like, <laughs> these guys have still done fine, but you didn't do as well as you had hoped. What are some of the things that you would have done different if you had to start over and some of the listeners listening, it's like, man, this is peaking my interest. Like I love real estate. I would want to get involved. What are some lessons learned that you would do different if you were starting again? Yeah. So I think finding good contractors early, I mean, I wouldn't let that prohibit you from starting, but finding good contractors, really building relationships with them and networking uh, will go a long way in your real estate career. Um, we found a lot of good houses early, but it took us a long time before we came proficient with contractors. And each house, to give you an idea, it costs us about a thousand bucks a month when it's vacant and not tenanted. Because I got to pay the mortgage on it, I got to pay the utilities, everything. And um, until we get a tenant in there, we don't make any money. So if a contractor goes three to four to five months over his timeline, then that's an extra three to five grand that we just burned through. So that, sure. you know, that can help you out a lot if you find a good contractor in the beginning. So they, you need some runway. So you're saying, yeah. hey, don't think that this thing is going to be finished on the date the contractor says, and you're going to get a tenant right away. And a lot of businesses fail as a result of being undercapitalized. Mm-hmm. And so I guess depending on how many you're buying as to how much runway that you need. But I'm hearing you say, hey, we need a little bit of bandwidth. You need some runway. Yeah. And, uh, so as far as uh, looking for other investors, like if somebody says, hey, I got a little bit of money, I'm like, you will, I can go and buy a couple of houses, kind of get started. How did you know when it was time to go out on the limb, find some hard money, some investors? How did you make the determination it was time? Yeah, I believe we had about eight houses at the time. And it took us maybe eight to 12 months to get those eight houses. I can't remember exactly the time frame. But we realized that it was a good formula. It was a solid formula that we had. We did our proof of concept and we realized we just needed more houses. It's a volume based business that we're in. So each house would make about 200 bucks a month. So we looked at how much money we wanted to make, which we set a goal of $100,000 a month for the business. And then my brother and I would split that in thirds and leave a third in the business. So you divide that all out and, um, ended up being 350 houses at $285 a month. If we can net that on all these houses is, uh, so, I mean, that's a big goal. And that's when we realized the fastest way to get there was to bring on other people's money. And 
because we pay our investors a decent amount. I mean, we're talking double digit returns and we'll cut them a check every month. So we don't make a whole lot of money when the house is on short term financing. But once we convert it over to long term and I get an interest rate of around six to seven to eight percent, then mm-hmm. you know, I pocket the delta. And that's what really that's when we start making our money. Well, here's the thing that we haven't even talked about, though, is the appreciation. Right. And so it's not something you can uh, spend, but man, your net worth is exponentially growing as a result of the equity that you're building in these properties. Cause now we are long-term fixed rate. You're paying down on the principal every single month. The cost of houses is going up. So the Delta is much greater than $285 a house or whatever you said, 200 something dollars a house, right? Yes. No way to really calculate that. But what are your thoughts on appreciation? Yeah, so appreciation is great. It helps for leveraging down the road if that's what you would want to do with your properties. Um, it, it looks good on your balance sheet. Um, but it, like you said, it is hard to spend. It's hard to eat equity. It. So, right. so you got to have enough cash on hand too. What is one of the biggest challenges that you're faced with today? Here you are just under 400 houses. Interest rates have gone up. Um, the face of the economy is different today than it's ever been before. What would you say that you and Ryan's biggest obstacle is? Yeah. So the scaling of business, I mean, we bought almost 200 houses this year. We're at 180 right now. We're on track to get the other 20 before the year ends. So as we have built this portfolio, things that I used to be able to do, like I used to do the books for us or enter in, uh, do like admin type things. I don't have enough physical time of the day to do all that admin stuff now. So I need to hire somebody. So just recognizing when you uh, get tapped out and then figuring out the right, the who, not how is a book that we read recently uh, within our mastermind group and uh, trying to figure out who you really need on your team to help you out. So the vision for you, for Ryan, uh, the company, Y'all personally, what does that look like? Let's just look at the next five or 10 years. Tell us about Ingram Properties and what that looks like. Yeah, so we just made our 2030 goal to have 3,500 houses here in the area. That's about 10 Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's let's go back. Say that again because I think I broke up a little bit. How many? Uh, By the end of 2030, we want to have 3,500 houses. So that's almost 10x of what we've got right now. Wow. So we've got what, seven years? Seven years. Yeah. To 10X. Man, that's a lofty goal. You feel good about that? I do. And it'll require us to grow along the way. Um, but just like anything else, it's worth having. I mean, it, it's hard work that has to be put in. And I mean, I'm not talking about working 60 to 70 hours a week because what the Come As You'll Be in 2023 also taught me is I have to focus on my family. And I have to have my my spiritual arena down or else I can't go out there and do the professional stuff. I just want to be um, as as focused or as driven. So if those two areas of my life are are no good, then uh, the the business side wouldn't be either. What are some of those boundaries? You're talking about really um, paying attention personally and professionally and spiritually. Uh, For you, what, what are some of those boundaries? Yeah. So I really enjoy taking one of my family members out every week and go on a, a date with dad is what I call it. So uh, I've got one wife, three kids. So I'll rotate through them every four weeks and you know, I put it on my calendar Tuesday afternoon and I really love making those. So, you know, when I've got to skip them or reschedule them, then it, it just makes me feel bad personally. Mm-hmm. And I try my best and this doesn't happen every week to limit my hours in the office to like 30 to 35 and then spend the other five to 10 hours with my family or playing golf. Because when I go out there and play golf, I love nature. I love being out there, love walking the course and the uh, camaraderie you get with whoever you're playing with. And that really helps me to reset and refocus. And uh, if I push that off, then I'll just get too stressed out and it makes me work slower and more inefficiently. So you're better prepared to make better decisions is what I'm hearing you say by taking the time off, which is contrary to popular belief. People think, hey, man, I put in 70, 80 hours. I'm going to get there faster. 
But that doesn't really sound like what you're saying. Yeah, yeah you're exactly right. So, and uh, yeah. I think it all starts with realizing where you're at. Like when I was selling heating and air, it was a 40 to 50 hour a week job, maybe 60 sometimes. And there's really no way of getting around that. Um, so for those folks out there who are working you know, 40 to 60 hours a week, there are other jobs out there to take where you can work less and still make the same amount of money. Might require you to learn a different skill set, but it can be done. Yeah, very good. And I love that. I know you're very familiar with the terminology full cup. We're always trying to share. We want to be givers, not takers. And I know you're a huge giver and you've given so much today during this time with us on the podcast, but would you like to end with a full cup? Would you mind sharing something that's been of benefit to you? Yeah, something that's been a benefit to me. I, um, I, I really love pouring into people. So it, it helps out a lot when you see that person making progress and putting forth the effort. Like uh, I've told a, a couple of people sometimes the steps they need to go through to change their lives and then they just drag their feet or they don't change. and it, You kind of lose hope after a little while. But I got this one particular fellow that I've been pouring into, and I mean, he's building a rental st real estate portfolio right alongside my brother and I. So he's a hard charger and, uh, you know, started with zero properties and now he's got about 70. So he, he's hustling too. I started a lending business and I uh, right. uh, lend money to him and he pays me a good return. The guy that I borrowed the money from, it's uh, his retirement fund. So we're able to pay him more now than what he was making when he was working. <laughs> and it's all because this guy's out there, they're hustling, working hard. He's copied our formula. And uh, we copied a different guy's formula who's got about 800 houses in the area. So it's just passing that down um, and sharing the knowledge. Well, again, that's contrary to what people teach. They say, hold your cards close to your vest. Don't share because... This young man is in the same community as you. Do you not view him as a competitor? No. There are so having an abundance mindset, I believe, is one of the most helpful things out there. Thinking that, you know, there's not a cap to the amount of money in the world, or by you making a couple more dollars, it doesn't bring somebody else down. So there there's ten thousand vacant homes in Dayton, and it it's gonna take a long time to fix all those. And we need as much help as we can get. So I'll be more than happy to share the formula with any other local entrepreneur or anybody who wants to you know, help out their own community as well. My brother's got a YouTube channel, just Ryan Ingram. You type that into YouTube, you'll find him. Guy with a big beard. But he shares exactly what we've done over the past couple of years to build our portfolio. You know, I think, Will, honestly, this is one of the reasons that you're being so successful. Honestly, I, I think you're being blessed as a result of sharing and giving and having an abundance mindset, not a scarcity mindset. Uh, young men, like the young man you mentioned earlier, uh, you're changing family trees within the environment that would be considered a direct competitor under normal circumstances. And you have poured into these guys. And as a result of that, you keep continue growing. He's growing. His family tree is changing. He's being successful. Man, I don't know how it gets any better than that. I mean, you just keep on keeping on. And this is the very reason that we wanted to have you on the show today. Will, any final comments or thoughts or words of encouragement before we let you go? Oh, I just really appreciate you having me out, Big A. So it's always fun talking about this kind of thing. You know, I love real estate, love talking about it, uh, finances, wealth, that, that sort of thing. And uh, really just benefiting the community as well. Realizing that it really takes, it's a team effort, life is, and realizing that it takes all of us to contribute whatever skill set you may have to the best of your ability. Not everybody's got the same skill set. So realizing that and then hiring folks who are the best at what they do instead of me trying to fumble my way through a weakness that I have, just using my strengths instead really helped me out a lot along the way. But well, we're going to take you up on the invitation if people want to know more about this. What's the easiest way to get in contact with you? Yeah, so probably just email me, um, wil at ingramcapital.us. And I think you're going to throw it up in a, in a link or something on the video. Oh, yeah, we'll put it in the show on. notes and we'll be happy to do that. Will, 
as always, buddy, you continue bringing it strong. So thank you for being with us today on View from the Top. All right. Thanks, Aaron and Kevin. Well, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Known these guys for a number of years, but really diving deep into their story and the practical application that they gave each and every one of us that we can apply this to our city. We can go out and invite the people that we need in order to accomplish this same goal that Will and Ryan has accomplished in their life. And I was so thankful that they laid out the practical steps that you too can take this and go learn how to invest in real estate so that hopefully it helps you on your journey to a view from the top. Hey, we heard Will talk today about what he called the Come As You Will Be in 2023. And that's actually a program that's part of the ISI Mastermind. And you can learn more about the Mastermind at viewfromthetop.com slash ISI. The easiest way to connect with us is really through our new email. It's just a weekly email called The Climb. And you're going to love it, man. This thing's pretty cool. It's a once a week, easy to digest, bite-sized topics that every small business owner, entrepreneur, husband, and father can really help them to live a life of success and significance as they climb to their own view from the top. So check it out at viewfromthetop.com slash climb to get free access now and not miss out on the very next issue. If you're new here and you just kind of listen to this one for the first time, uh, be sure to look back through the previous episodes for topics that you need help with. Maybe you need a little inspiration, a little motivation just to get your button gear. You can do that on your favorite listening platform, or you can go to viewfromthetop.com slash podcast to discover more. As always, you can reach us via email at pod at viewfromthetop.com. That's P-O-D at viewfromthetop.com. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you all next week.